Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Diligent Watchman. My name is Clinton Kowach. Uh, today is December 12th, 2016, and uh, there, there's quite a bit to talk about. Um, you know, we need to talk about uh, the markets and how the Dow is close to 20,000 and the implications that's going to be for silver coming forward. Um, also, what's going on between the United States, China, Taiwan, and Donald Trump's tweets. Um, that could be a major conflict that's happening. And then finally, with uh, the holidays coming forward, um, I just want to, you know, just spend a little bit of time just explaining kind of what, what my family does and what, how we see the holidays uh, and hope, you know, put, put a little bit more scripture into the, the holiday itself. You know, I've been asked a lot, uh, especially recently, about what's going on with the world economy and what's going on with the, the Dow. Um, because people are looking at it, and since Donald Trump became elected, uh, the Dow's gone up 1,200 points. Uh, we're looking at close to 20,000, and, you know, it was unheard of to get even close to that high uh, in, in the past. Um, so now it's hitting astronomical uh, levels that have never been touched before, and it's going to go up. Um, you know, that, that's the thing is, is people don't understand, you know, the reason that the, the stock exchange has gone up so much and that the Dow has gone up so much is because of the policy of the central bank. Um, the central bank, had, ever since 2008, when they did the massive bailout where they gave the, the, um, the banks, you know, like Wells Fargo and, and uh, uh, Citibank and all these other banks, uh, so much money to bail them out because they were insolvent from the derivatives that were out there. Um, since that point, um, other bailouts have gone through as well to the point that they are contributing, you know, a large portion of, of you know, this, this bailout to the market. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's got to the point that um, a lot of these bailouts, all they are is just repurchase of the stock from the actual company itself um, to just increase the stock price. Um, before this, it was actually set to where the people were buying bonds. And that was where the big bubble was. But we've recently seen that start to hit in the negative. So people really are throwing the money into the stock exchange because they don't know where else to put it. They, the euro is in disarray. Um, the Brexit vote, Britain is, is actually looking to pull away, even though they haven't actually filed the paperwork. Uh, you have insolvency in Italy. You have insolvency in Spain. You have you know, all these other European countries that are in trouble. France is basically in a martial law until February still. Um, so the banking system across the world is just in chaos, and, and people really don't know where else to put their money except for in the U.S. dollar and inside the stock exchange. Um, what, what they don't understand is that every currency is what's called a fiat currency now. Um, this is actually the first time in the, in the world history that every single currency is based off of a fiat currency, which is paper money. Um, it, it used to be that, that money was based off of gold, or they had some kind of backing by something. Even back in the day when you traded shells, you actually the shell was actually worth something. It wasn't just a piece of paper, but it was perceived wealth. Um, now we have a system where gold is, is traded at more as a commodity than actually a monetary mineral. And, and that has actually changed um, the way that the world sees gold and silver. Now, the problem is when you have a, a currency that is based off of nothing, um, what happens is countries then print, 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 because they know that they can buy more stuff with their money. Um, one of the most recent examples, um, despite the last you know, couple of years, would be Zimbabwe in 2008. Uh, Zimbabwe, their president, uh, uh, realized that he could print, 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 and he did to the point that there was $100 trillion bills out there. Um, it, was, it was so bad that people were putting stacks of cash in wheelbarrows and taking them in, and they would have to weigh them to actually see how much it was worth because you couldn't even count the papers. Um, it, it just became worthless, absolutely worthless. Um, in today's time, we actually have the same exact thing happening in Venezuela. Uh, their currency, the hyperinflation has taken off. Um, people are actually having to weigh their bills instead of count them when they go to turn them in. Uh, food is, is not on the, the shelves at the grocery stores to where um, over 100,000 people had to go to a neighboring country just to try to find food. 
Um, so Venezuela is complete chaos, and this is basically be based off of a fiat system. People, the government, per, you know, printing too much money, and then the money gets to where it's worth nothing because there's too much of it, and then it crashes, and then the people are left with nothing or a new currency that they have to turn their old paper into. So, and, and that's kind of what happened in India. Um, recently, India made what's equivalent to the five and ten dollar bill in the United States um, illegal, and the reason for that is they had a complete counterfeit system over there, to where too many of these bills were counterfeit, and so they came up with the, a recall of the notes for a new currency to try to get these counterfeit off of there, which is not necessarily uh, the truth. Um, yes, they do have that problem, but you can also see in other countries like Sweden and Australia that there is a, a battle against cash. Um, the, the central banks, they, they don't want people to use cash. They want people to use credit or digital. And, and the reason for that is they can actually track every person's purchases. They can track everything about you if everything is set up digital. If it's set through cash, you can't. So, so that is the, the end game in that scenario. But going back to India, um, you actually have to where people are were storming into the banks to try to trade their money back for this currency. And these little side note that a lot of people didn't look into, and I actually didn't look into this and find this out until today. Um, but if you are behind in your taxes in Italy or you owe the government taxes, uh, they now have the authority to go into your house search a premises and if you have you know for female what equals about nine ounces of gold and for males about 18 ounces of gold if you have more than that they can confiscate your gold and take it from you um, now india is is a culture that part of their religion is to adorn themselves with gold so a lot of Indians have a lot of gold because it's something they've been collecting for generations. It's something that they've had for a long time. It's something that they gather on a regular basis, especially during the religious times. So this is going to be a major issue in India when they actually start, if they haven't already, going into these people's homes and confiscating their gold. Now, you know, people say that would never happen in the United States, but if you know anything about history, it actually did happen in the United States. Um, right around the Great Depression. You know, part of the, the United States government plan was to confiscate gold. And they, you know, did it voluntarily. You turn it in and you get, you know, some money back, you know, for this new currency or for a different currency or in that case for the U.S. dollar. Um, then they make it to where it's illegal to have it. And they did the same thing in the United States. And history repeats itself. And so you can see it happening in India. And it's going to continue happening across the globe. So you have this, this problem where no one knows what to do with their money. No one knows if the money is going to be worth anything. No one really knows how the world's going to shape up. Um, you know, you have the markets hate instability. They hate the unknown. But yet the, the stock market, the Dow is over almost 20,000. So th this doesn't make sense when we have all this unknown. We have Donald Trump, who is the president-elect, talking about how he's going to um, turn away NATO, how he's going to um, – the TPP is completely dead. Um, and, and what's happening is all these countries that we were negotiating with to, to establish this trade deal are now turning to China. So by us not opening our arms to the world community and not opening up these trade channels – we basically opened up the door for China to start a trade war against us. Um, and and it, in the business world, it's called business, doing business. You go after the largest market share. China's going to go after as much market share as they can in the world. And we just basically said, here, take a big chunk of ours. Um, the United States is set up to where we need the entire world to sustain our economy, just like China needs the entire world to sustain theirs. The problem is we are making it, and we're going to make it under the Trump administration, make it very difficult for the United States to do trade with the partners around the world, which makes it very easy for them to do with China, which makes them gravitate to China. And in the case of Turkey, they're already willing to trade in that currency. So instead of using the United States dollar, 
they can use the yen or whatever other currency that country is coming from. And Turkey has come out and said that they will trade with whatever currency that people use. What that spells, unfortunately, is the death of what's called the petrodollar. Um, a lot of people think that the United States dollar is going to be the reserve currency, the major currency in the world that everyone uses for forever. Um, that what they don't realize is that the only reason that people in the world actually use the United States dollar is because of the trade of oil in U.S. dollars. Um, once the world actually stops trading the United States dollar or trading oil with the United States dollar, the dollar will lose all relevance whatsoever. That is why we are in the Middle East. We have to control someone there that will trade in U.S. dollars and keep the oil trade in U.S. dollars. If the, they do not do that, the U.S. dollar will crash and will be worth nothing. What will happen is all these countries who have been using the U.S. dollar will stop using dollars. All those dollars will come back to the United States because either they will purchase our real estate because things will be on sale, or they'll purchase our businesses, or they will just purchase our bonds or stocks or whatever it may, may think of. But all of that money is going to come back to the United States. Once that money flows back to the United States, then we have inflation. We have inflation to the point that we could see hyperinflation for the amount of U.S. dollars outside the economy, or outside the U.S. economy and in the world. Um, you know, you look at just little things that Donald Trump has, has said he's going to do. You know, it makes sense for someone in his standpoint that has so much money trapped overseas that he cannot bring it into the U.S. market to open up those floodgates so he can bring his money into the United States. He has other wealthy friends with the same problem. So it makes sense that he's going to try to open up those doors and those laws so that way the money can come back to the United States. What he doesn't realize is once he does that, he invites inflation into the United States. The only reason the United States is not being hit like Venezuela, not being hit like India, not being hit by these other, like these other countries is because we have exported our inflation. Once he reverses that, and it will, when, when he turns away the TPP, when he turns away NATO, when he turns away NAFTA, when he turns away, you know, <laughs> any trade, um, he, he's going to make it to where we're not going to be able to sell any products. We rely on purchasing products. So then these other countries are going to raise their prices. There's going to be tariffs because we're going to promote American products, which means that the prices for everyone are going to go up, which equals inflation. He is going to bring all that money in. So his you know, the, the people on top that have a lot of money are going to bring their money into the United States. And either they're going to put it in the banking system, they're going to put it into the stock exchange, they're going to buy businesses, they're going to, you know, whatever they do with it, it's all going to come back into the United States economy, which is going to cause inflation. That's the definition of inflation, too much money, basically. You know, and, and you... You have the, these issues. Now, what they're trying to counteract is they anticipate tons of inflation, but they're looking to actually raise the interest rates this December. They have to somehow gather more tax revenue or do massive cuts if they are going to increase any kind of interest rate. Uh, right now, if they increase the interest rate by half, half a percentage, the amount that we owe on just the interest is going to be more than we collect in taxes for the, the entire United States. So there's no way to pay back this debt and there's no way to truly increase the interest rates and actually <laughs> accomplish anything uh, because you're just going to put yourself in debt. Um, so what they're going to have to do is print more money, which also adds more money into the system, which adds inflation. Um, the, the problem they've been running into is they, they, they've been trying to keep inflation away. So they've been giving the bailouts to the banks. And the banks have been propping up certain indicators, economic indicators, uh, to prove their point. Um, the Dow is one of those. The bond market was another one. Um, and, and 
they, so it's an illusion, thinking that trickle down would work. You you put the money at the top and it goes down to the bottom people. Well, well, the the top that got the the money, the banks that got the money, the bailout and everything, they didn't use the money like they're supposed to. They were supposed to open it up and lend to people and and make it easier for people to get loans. And instead, they did the opposite. So now the the economy is stagnant again. Uh, we see the same indicators happening now as in 2000. Um, and, and so because we have history repeating itself again, we know the direction is going to happen. We know that the stock market is overinflated. We know the housing market is overinflated because the same indicators are there. But when you start to look at how those indicators are interpreted, they're, they're being twisted to where it shows that things are actually positive, to where we have a robust economy to where unemployment rates are down, you know, to where things are they're good. So if you look from the top down, everything looks good. If you look from the bottom up, everything is not good. Um, and the only way to get us out of this, unfortunately, is to reset the system. Um, there is no way mathematically that the dollar can survive. Um, and so what do people do in this scenario? If the dollar doesn't survive, they've confiscated gold in the past. And gold is considered the only monetary metal. Uh, Silver is now considered an industrial metal. So what do, what do you do? Well, history repeats itself. Back, you know, people compare the United States and the similarities to the United States to the Roman Empire. And you can look at, at what happened during the fall of the Roman Empire. And you can see a lot of those similarities happening now. You know, corporate political structure, um, massive inflation, uh, an empire that spread too far. Um, the only thing we haven't seen is invasion. Um, but that could still happen. Um, and, and so because of these similarities between the two, you have to kind of look at the monetary system back then. And, and basically how... The soul, how we'll take a soldier for instance. Uh, a soldier during Roman times was paid with one shilling, and and that was one per day. And that one shilling is basically a silver coin the, the size of a dime. And um, in that time, that, that dime was enough to buy food, housing, clothing, sustain himself or his family. I mean, everything just off of one of those a day. So if history was to repeat itself, then technically you only need that much silver to sustain yourself per day. So if you if you think of it that way, and that's how the Roman Empire and how the Romans actually sustained themselves during a similar time in history, it wasn't gold that the average person used. Um, it, it was silver. And that was what was readily traded. That was what people used as currency. So our system now concerning gold as a monetary metal and silver as an industrial metal is actually backwards. Um, gold was always held as, as a store of wealth or a show of wealth. Um, ancient civilizations used to adorn themselves with gold to show their status and, and show who they were. Um, silver was what they carried to, to buy things. Jesus, you know, was... was um, <laughs> betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. And, you know, that shows the value of, of silver because those 30 sil uh, pieces of silver was used to buy a plot of land that is currently uh, a cemetery. So, so I mean, silver actually has a store of value. Now, when you think of it as an industrial metal, um, the reason that they have classified it that is because of the modern technology. And all the computers and cell phones, there's silver within it because it's an incredible conductor of electricity. Um, you also have the solar panels, tons of silver used to make the solar panels. Um, you have silvers and band-aids in clothing that help you know, fight away bacteria, um, surgical you know, instruments. So silver is being used up very rapidly. And, and when you think about throughout the history, every ounce of gold, has always been stored. It, it was considered like, you know, it was considered a treasure to hold on to, to gold, where silver is being used up to the point that today, 
the above ground silver is actually more rare than the above ground gold. Um, and that shouldn't be the case in any way. Uh, historically, in mining terms, for every one ounce of gold, you would get about 16 ounces of silver is what the, the, the value would be. Uh, and that's historically. Um, in today's terms, one ounce of gold equates to about 65, 70 ounces of silver. So silver, according to historical values, is drastically down. Um, it's, it's cheap in a way um, compared to its attachment to gold historically. And the reason is because, you know, people have forgotten that it's a monetary metal. Um, when, when everything happens, you're, you're going to have, a, you know, the, the United States dollar is going to be worthless. And it could be overnight like it was in India. And once that happens, there will be an, a replacement. And, you know, whatever that replacement is, if it's, you know, uh, digital, if it's a new currency, people have talked about the Amero for many years, uh, which was a joint currency between Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Um, you know, some people have talked about the new reserve currency that actually has uh, China that was added into it um, as being used as the, the world currency. But no one really knows. All that we know is there is a, a massive battle going on between you know, the different uh, businesses, the, the banking systems, basically. You know, you have the Western system, which is, you know, Great Britain, Europe, and the United States. You have the, uh, you know, the uh, BRICS, uh, BRICS nations uh, who have branched off and made their own banking system, which is, you know, China, Russia, Brazil, India, and South Africa. Um, and now you also have this new exchange in, you know, the Arab nations where they can actually buy gold and silver and they're based on more of a gold standard. So you have this economic war that has already been happening. And that's always the first step of any kind of war. Um, the, this, the second is always the one people notice, but no one really notices the first one. And so that's where we're at right now. Now, moving on to talking about war, um, the, the current situation between the United States and China, um, primarily Donald Trump's tweets and China about Taiwan. I mean, the United States has stood true that they have always been standoffish in their association to Taiwan. Um, the reason for that is because Taiwan is a democratic nation, or they want to be a democratic nation. And they've been a branch off of China, and China basically said at one point they will go into Taiwan and we'll get that land back. Um, and the United States has always said, no, you won't. We will support them. And, and so that's where the standstill kind of stayed is the, the agreement was regard China as one country, one you know, unit including Taiwan, and we won't attack you, kind of thing. And so that's kind of what the standstill is. So, so Taiwan, <coughs> excuse me, Taiwan has been um, just kind of living on their own. You know, just trying to survive with their you know big bad stepbrother in, in China watching over them, and that lay dormant for forty years. Now, because of Donald Trump, uh, you know, tweeting that he talked with the, the president of Taiwan, he, he put the Taiwanese people in serious trouble. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't get it. He, he doesn't understand that China can go in there and take them out at any moment. And the United States is verbally obligated to support them. So, you know, I mean, if we don't support someone as defenseless as, as Taiwan, even though we've you know, sold them $40 billion worth of arms, you know, since, you know, 2000 or something like that. Um, you know, they're a little tiny defenseless country against China. It, if something happens to where China actually does what they've said for many decades and actually goes into Taiwan, is Trump going to actually back the Taiwanese people? Um, because all he's done is actually just stand and talk tough to China. You know, I mean, I understand that he knows how to negotiate in the business world and he knows how to talk to people. But in the business world, the 
if you have a product that someone wants to buy and they don't want to agree to your terms, they don't get your product. Um, that's just basic business. The problem is when you're dealing with politics, if China has something that we want and they won't give it to us, or we have something that China wants and we won't give it to China, uh, they can just bomb us. And, and that's not the scenario that Donald Trump even, I think, comprehends. Um, is that if you go too hard against the Chinese com uh, government, though they have no qualms. I mean, you look at what, what happened in Tiananmen Square, uh, you know, where they shot on the students. They have no problems doing this to their own people. They have no problems doing it to the United States. And, and we've already or have tensions with China, with, with the building of the islands in the South China Sea. So we have major issues already with China. And now we have president-elect who hasn't even got into office, Trump, already picking a fight with him. You know, I mean, it, 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 it all fits, though. It, it all fits. Um, I mean, you can see the, the battle lines being drawn. Um, you can see where the alliances are joining up. Um, for instance, you have the, the president of the Philippines has come out and said that, you know, he's not going to deal with the United States. Get all of your troops off your bases. You're no longer welcome here. I'm going to do all my business with Russia and China. And he's done that. Um, and he's not the only country that has done that. Um, other countries have strengthened their ties um, with China and Russia. Um, and so we're gonna we're we're gonna be in a very interesting situation if Donald Trump tries to talk too tough with China, saying that he's going to bully them around because, well, China actually makes everything that we purchase. Yeah, not everything. A large portion of what we have they make. What does the United States make that we export to China? Our financial system. That's it. So, you know, if, if we don't export anything to them, they have all the power. All they have to do is go, fine, we're not going to use your financial system or your dollar. And all that does is make issues for us. So we have, we're not going to make any, any strives talking tough with China. Um, but we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens here in the near future, but uh, it's not looking good as today. Um, just as a show of force, <coughs> excuse me again, China actually flew one of their nuclear armed uh, planes um, right right over the China Sea and, and over the ships that we have there. Just as a, as a, a sign to President like Trump that you, you need to pay attention to what you're messing with. Um, let alone the numerous references to Trump being a rookie, um, not knowing what he's doing, um, idiotic. Um, wh whatever else you can say is coming out of China, they're calling Trump. So he, he needs to he needs to change his approach because in less than two weeks he's already made China uh, very very upset with us, and I think that's the last country the United States should go to. Um, and finally, you know, with, with the holidays coming up, um, you know, I just want everyone to be, to be safe and to remember what is truly important. Um, you know, if you look at Christmas as what it is, um, it, it's, you know, people that have a lot with, um, a tree ordained with gold and silver uh, hung in their house um, with offerings putting underneath it as in presents um, and, and you don't look at you know that we've done this for years that it's just a symbol and it's Christmas and it's fun but actually look at it from a more of a, a godly standpoint uh, we are not to ordain or um, give blessings to anything but God um, and just the symbol is symbolic way that we go about our ritual of Christmas. Um, every year we put lights up. Every year we hang a tree. Every year we adorn it with gold and silver. Every year we put presents underneath it. Every year 
we wait until one moment and then open it. Yes, many Christians celebrate this because of Jesus' birth. And that is wonderful that there's a celebration for Jesus' birth. The problem is the symbolism. The problem is the uses behind it and the importance that has been placed on the Christmas tree, the importance that has been placed on the presents, the importance of what's mine and what am I going to get and, and that greed. Those are not that God wanted. Those are not things that Jesus wanted. It, it, it's not what they would want to celebrate our Savior is greed. He, he was not greedy in any way. Jesus never took. He always gave. And if you're going to give, give with no strings attached. Don't worry about the symbolism. Don't worry about the tree. Don't worry about the lights. And enjoy God in this. And, and do yourself and read Jeremiah chapter 10. I think it's very important to understand where the history of certain traditions have come from and the history behind the Christmas tree. And once you do research, you know, you can actually see if it's something that you should keep within your holiday festivities. Thank you for listening to The Diligent Watchman. This is Clinton Coach. May God guide you on your journey.